welcome to our annual celebration of World Heritage. I'm speaking to you virtually from Washington, D.C., which is the actual homeland of the Anacostia and Piscataway tribes. My name is Douglas Comer, and I'm president of the United States National Committee of ICOMOS. ICOMOS is the advisory body on cultural issues to UNESCO, as was established by the World Heritage Committee, or Convention. The overall intent of the convention is to promote international and intercultural understanding. To accomplish these objectives at this moment in history, we must multiply our efforts. You will hear about the development of the convention from the next speakers, Jan C.K. Anderson, who heads our celebration and development committees, and Irina Bokova, former UNESCO Director General. Now, one important means of promoting international and intercultural understanding is by the establishment of World Heritage Sites, sites that have outstanding universal value. They tell us how all cultures are interconnected. This evening, we will hear from seven of the sites that are on the United States tentative list, and that is the short list of sites that are intended eventually to be nominated by the United States to the World Heritage List. These are places of enormous beauty, and they testify to what human beings from remarkably diverse backgrounds can accomplish when they respect differences and work together, what they can build, the treasures that they can preserve. Please feel free to use the chat function to ask questions. We will respond to some briefly toward the end of this evening's program and to others in the days to follow. On our program two will be a brief introduction to the toolkit that U.S. ECOMOS is developing with the generous support of the Mellon Foundation for decision makers who must deal with monuments associated with oppression. You will meet our program director, Sakina Moore, who will provide a short video produced by her excellent team. Following our question and answer session, we will toast to the 50th anniversary of the World Heritage Convention. Now that's going to end tonight's celebration, but immediately following will be a special session on the situation in Ukraine. Your screens will go black for 30 seconds prior to this session, but you need only to stay connected to watch. You will hear from some of the founders of ICOMOS Ukraine, including the person who has been appointed to liaison between ICOMOS Ukraine and ICOMOS International. You will also hear from Katarina Chueva, Deputy Minister of Culture and Information Policy of Ukraine, who is in Kiev. We hope to have just a few minutes of live questions for her. Now this connection is uncertain and might be interrupted by air sirens, but we will do our best. And with that, I would like to introduce Jan C.K. Anderson. Thank you. Good evening. I am Jan Anderson. I'm a fellow of U.S. ICOMOS and the immediate past president. It is my pleasure to welcome all our distinguished guests who have joined us this evening to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the World Heritage Convention. Let me begin by thanking the very distinguished honorary chairs of our celebration this year. Irina Bokova, former Director General of UNESCO, our 2017 honoree and our speaker this evening. UNESCO Ambassador Esther Coopersmith, our 2014 honoree, and Henry Munoz III, our 2019 honoree. I would also like to thank our very distinguished host committee and our sponsors to whom we are very grateful. The Alabama Department of Tourism, the American Institute of Architects, the Central Parks Conservancy, Historic Moravian Bethlehem, the Ohio History Convention, Preservation Chicago, Ronald Lee Fleming, and Timothy Whalen. I support, the support of each of you is essential to the success of our mission to preserve our irreplaceable shared world heritage. As we watch in horror the tragic war that is being waged against Ukraine, it is important that we remember that U.S. ICOMOS was founded as a result of the international collaboration that flowed from efforts to restore the cultural heritage 
destroyed in World War II. Clearly, the work of Icomos and U.S. Icomos is as urgent today as it was then. When our shared cultural heritage is destroyed, all humanity suffers. The tragic loss of life in Ukraine and our irreplaceable globally shared heritage is a profound loss to all humanity. We must all stand with the people of Ukraine to help them to survive and thrive and to preserve and restore their cultural heritage and their democracy. This evening, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the former Director General of UNESCO, Irina Bogova. At our celebration in 2017, we honored Irina with our award for intercultural dialogue for her brilliant leadership of UNESCO and her exceptional stewardship of the World Heritage Convention. During her tenure as Director General, Irina always was a stalwart friend of U.S. ICOMOS. Ten years ago, as we celebrated the 40th anniversary of the World Heritage Convention, we recognized Irina not only for her exceptional leadership of UNESCO, but notably for the priority and support that she accorded the World Heritage Program. Arena has always embraced Russell Train's transformative idea of our globally shared heritage. In turbulent times and with grace and courage, Irina Bokova used this revolutionary idea as a tool for peace and sustainable development. Since its creation in 1972, the World Heritage Convention has accomplished a great deal. We have gone from what was an American idea to 1,154 designated World Heritage Sites in 167 countries around the globe. And now, just 50 years later, there are 194 states parties around the globe that have ratified the convention. During the last 50 years, UNESCO and the World Heritage Program has been a remarkable international success story. In fact, it is the most successful convention of the United Nations. It has brought the nations of the world together in common pursuit of the preservation of the world's cultural and natural heritage. The UNESCO World Heritage Program has made a profound difference as a driver of healthy economies, as well as for the protection of the world's unique shared heritage. Both are fundamental to UNESCO's 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Undeniably, Heritage unites us, even as the challenges of preserving our heritage become more complex. So it is ironic that the United States, as the architect of the World Heritage Convention and the first country to sign and ratify it, has withdrawn from UNESCO as of January 2019. In spite of the census and self-defeating decision by the United States to withdraw from UNESCO, Irina Bogova has worked diligently and has remained steadfast and committed to returning the United States to good standing at UNESCO. Although it may seem a Sisyphean task, it is essential that we persist with our efforts to restore the stature of the United States in UNESCO. In spite of our turbulent times, we now celebrate 50 years of this great humanist idea of a trust for cultural and natural heritage, which was the brainchild of Russell Train. And it was Russell Train to whom U.S. Psychomos gave the first award and the first US, at the first U.S. Psychomos celebration of world heritage in 2009 at the Cosmos Club. In this flat world of Russell of Thomas Friedman, Russell Train's grand and transformative vision of our globally shared heritage is increasingly germane. And in spite of, and in response to these turbulent times, Irina Bogova nurtured this revolutionary idea and used it wisely and effectively as a tool for sustainable, sustainable development and for peace. Irina Bogova is truly an outstanding guardian of the vision of world heritage as we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the World Heritage Convention, it is my distinct pleasure to invite our friend, the incomparable Irina Bogova, to share her thoughts on the past 50 years and the path forward. Clearly the road ahead will be challenging. 
I look forward to Irina enlightening us about our future. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, what a pleasure to be once again with you this year, supporters, experts, and all those who are passionate about world heritage. And thank you, Jen, for the invitation and for everything US ICOMOS is doing to keep the flame of conservation and preservation of world heritage. And what an honor to be again a co-chair of this annual gathering together with extraordinary supporters of this idea, my dear personal friend and UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador, Esther Coopersmith, and with Henry Munoz III, with whom I believe we share a common passion for culture and creativity. 2020 is an emblematic year when we will be celebrating the 50th anniversary of the adoption of the World Heritage Convention. And I would like from the outset to pay a special tribute to the vision and leadership of the man who strongly promoted this idea, the Honorable Russell Train. Today, with its 193 parties, the World Heritage Convention is the most universally adhered international convention. And with its 1,154 sites in 167 countries, as of last year, on the World Heritage List, it is indeed an open book of the cultural diversity of humanity. I have always considered that safeguarding world heritage is one of the most positive, transformative, visionary ideas that emerged in the 20th century. The idea that heritage belonging to different cultures may represent outstanding universal value. The idea that humanity stands united in all its diversity around shared values. The idea that heritage should not, and differences should not divide us, but on the contrary, they should unite us. And that culture and heritage is not simply about bricks and stones, but they are about identities and belongings. It is Russell Train's vision that is reflected today in all of these more than 1,000 World Heritage Sites, including the 24 inscribed on the World Heritage List by the United States, from the cultural sites of Poverty Point and the Native Americans like the Taos Pueblo, the San Antonio Missions, which are an example of the interweaving of the cultures of the Spanish, and the Coahuiltecan and other indigenous peoples to the Statue of Liberty and Independent Hall, and not least to the 20th century architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright. All of them tell the incredible story of America and the remarkable diversity and creativity of its people. But there is more story to be told the civil rights movement sites, including churches in several states, national historic sites. And some of the important emblematic events, the Selma to Montgomery National Historic Trail, which commemorates the full route of the 1964 voting rights march. This is a story that has to be, and I do believe that it will be inscribed on the World Heritage List. Today, ladies and gentlemen, when we are living through difficult, and I would say dangerous, times of war in Ukraine, of post-pandemic world, with unprecedented economic, social, health, and environmental crisis, we should renew again our commitment to heritage and culture. As we gather to celebrate the 50th anniversary of heritage preservation, we should look at the new opportunities, some of science and technology, and the recent devastating events, such as the burning of Notre Dame, the deliberate destruction of the Bamiyan Buddhas in Afghanistan, the violent ruin of many sites in Syria, remind us that cultural heritage 
as is at constant risk, as much today as throughout history. Only 15% of world cultural heritage is currently available in a digitized form. Regardless of how well they have been protected and preserved, a great majority of ancient artifacts and sites are naturally prone to corrosion due to age, not to speak about the other threats that I already mentioned. So we are inspired by the crucial role today that digital technology is playing in helping the cultural sector to meet the challenges of reconstructing, restoring what has been lost, or at the very least, recording remainders for the future. By adopting new technologies to preserve and share information about our heritage, and by digitizing valuable collections and making the data available to experts, we can help to safeguard many heritage sites. And I wish to end with the words of Russell Twain that he spoke in Venice 20 years ago in, 20, in 2002 on the occasion of the 30th anniversary of the adoption of the World Heritage Convention. At this particular time in history, he said, as the fabric of civilized human society seems increasingly under attack by forces that deny the very existence of a shared heritage, forces that strike at the very heart of our sense of community, I'm convinced that world heritage holds out a contrary and positive vision of human society and our common future. These words have not aged a day because I do believe that in turbulent times, in culture and in heritage, we find a safe harbor. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to address you again this year and happy celebration of the 50th anniversary of World Heritage. Thank you for your attention. What they did here will reverberate through the ages, not because their victory was complete, but because they proved that nonviolent change is possible, that love and hope can conquer hate. What they did here inspired the world. We invite you to witness a stage in human history to recognize the bastions of nonviolent resistance that remove the color line of racial division constructed across the United States South with its separate and unequal schools, public accommodations, and neighborhoods. The civil rights movement forced the nation and encouraged the world to treat everyone equally in the eyes of the law, regardless of race, ethnicity, religion, creed, sex, or physical ability. At these iconic civil rights sites, a powerful freedom movement occurred where activists such as the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. led protests against racial segregation in the built environment, adapting Gandhi's methods of nonviolent resistance and influencing freedom struggles around the globe. We can never be satisfied. As long as our body is heavy with the fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the cities, We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating for whites only. No, no, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Black places of worship beat as the heart of the civil rights movement. Within these walls, leaders and foot soldiers alike found their courage and unity. Although targeted by white supremacists, who bombed Bethel Baptist Church three times and the 16th Street Baptist Church, killing four young black girls during Sunday morning services, civil rights activists never gave up in their quest for integration. As a shocked world condemned the violence, 
the children of Wales donated a stained glass window in memory of the young martyrs. From the beginning, black youth set the tone of the protest, rejecting the unequal school buildings in which they received inferior educations compared to those for white children. Barbara Johns led classmates out of the colored Moton High School in Farmville, Virginia, sparking a lawsuit that joined Linda Browns in Topeka, Kansas, and three others that resulted in the historic United States Supreme Court ruling Brown v. Board of Education, which found as unconstitutional racial segregation in public schools. Soon, the National Security Council reported that in Africa, the Brown decision was regarded as the greatest event since the Emancipation Proclamation. Black youth put the ruling to the test when they attended the all-white Central High School in Arkansas. At first, white supremacists defended racial segregation by denying African-Americans entrance and heckling 15-year-old Elizabeth Eckford as she approached the building. But President Dwight Eisenhower responded to the white mob by sending soldiers to escort the Little Rock Nine to class, thereby upholding the Brown decision. Integrating schools was just the beginning. Soon, the ruling applied to unequal accommodations in transportation, with such protests as the Montgomery bus boycott and the Freedom Rides. When four black college students demanded service at the whites-only Woolworth lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina, they launched a sit-in movement that spread across the South, demanding equal access to commercial spaces. Police dogs and fire hoses used by Alabama authorities failed to keep demonstrators in the black section of Birmingham. The murder of Medgar Evers outside his home on a black street in Jackson failed to stop the protests in Mississippi. Their efforts had powerful effect, drawing the eyes of the world and forcing President John F. Kennedy to propose historic legislation, setting the stage for the Civil Rights Act of 1964 with its promise of equal access to everyone. Shall I ask the Congress of the United States to act, to make a commitment it is not fully made in this century to the proposition that race has no place in American life or law. Along with desegregation, African Americans wanted black political empowerment. The bloody Sunday beating of nonviolent activists on the Edmund Pettus Bridge failed to halt the Selma to Montgomery march, resulting in the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Even the silencing of Martin Luther King Jr., shot dead on the balcony of the segregated Lorraine Motel, failed to prevent the changes underway. The movement dismantled the structural indignities of the color line, ending legal white supremacy in the built environment, creating an integrated society. These accomplishments influenced others around the world, including South Africa's first black president, Nelson Mandela, who echoed King, declaring, free at last, following his inauguration in 1994. In the words of the first black president of the United States, Barack Obama, because of what they did. The doors of opportunity swung open, not just for black folks, but for every American. Women marched through those doors. Latinos marched through those doors. Asian Americans, gay Americans, Americans with disabilities, they all came through those doors. What they did here dismantled racial segregation. What they did here advanced equality. What they did here brought the dream closer to reality. So all could come through those doors. What they did here inspired the world. Along the great rivers of southern Ohio, whose names evoke the tribal nations who plied their waters at the time of European contact, Miami, Scioto, and Muskingum, indigenous civilizations created monumental works of earth in varying shapes and sizes and for a variety of purposes. Remnants of many of these sites have been placed on the United States Department of the Interior's tentative list of sites to be considered for nomination to the UNESCO World Heritage List. The Hopewell Ceremonial Earthworks is a serial nomination of eight earthworks, which brings together the four most surviving examples of the various kinds of gigantic earthen enclosures and mounds built by the ancient indigenous cultural collective that archaeologists have named the Hopewell culture. 
These indigenous societies constructed earthworks in various geometric shapes, including circles, squares, and octagons, and earthworks whose shape was determined largely by the outlines of the bluffs on which they were built. They are masterpieces of human creative genius, built by societies that did not live in cities, that had no authoritarian leaders, and who did not rely on maize agriculture to feed the large numbers of people who periodically came together at these vast ceremonial enclosures. Gun Earthworks, a surviving remnant of the once more extensive Newark Earthworks, is a large circular enclosure connected to an even larger octagon by a parallel walled avenue. The main axis of the earthwork is oriented to the point on the eastern horizon where the moon rises at its northernmost position. These earthworks also include alignments to the other key moon rises and moon sets that mark the moon's 18.6 year long cycle. Although the site has been used as a golf course since 1911, it is owned by the Ohio History Connection, which is working to restore full public access to the site. The Great Circle Earthworks is another preserved section of the Newark Earthworks. It is the largest and best preserved of the Hopewell Circular Earthworks. It has a single grand gateway with an interior ditch that once held water. The Fort Ancient Earthworks enclose 40 hectares of a high bluff overlooking the Little Miami River in Western Ohio. It is the largest and is among the best preserved of the Hopewell hilltop enclosures. In spite of the name, it is not a fort, but rather another kind of ceremonial space. The Scioto River Valley in Southern Ohio has been described as the epicenter of the cultural explosion of art, architecture, and ceremony that has been called the Hopewell culture. Five of the most iconic earthwork sites are preserved in Hopewell Culture National Historical Park. Hopeton Earthwork is a circle connected to a square that together enclose a total of 15.5 hectares. Mound City is located just across the river from Hopeton. It is a square with rounded corners that surrounds a large number of burial mounds. High Bank Works is another circular earthwork connected to an octagon. Like Newark's octagon earthworks, it also is aligned to the 18.6 year long cycle of moon rises and moon sets. The Hopewell Mound Group is located in the valley of the North Fork of the Paint Creek, a tributary of the Scioto River. It is the largest of all Hopewell earthen enclosures, and its many mounds contain an extraordinary array of ceremonial regalia crafted from raw materials brought from as far away as the Gulf of Mexico and the Rocky Mountains. The Sipe earthworks are in the Paint Creek Valley, which is a tributary of the Scioto River. Two large circles combine with the square to enclose a total of 36 hectares. Serpent Mound is a gigantic sculpture of a snake that extends for more than 400 meters along a narrow bluff overlooking Ohio Brush Creek in Southern Ohio. It is on the United States tentative list as a separate potential nomination to the United Nations World Heritage List. The mound is made up of three distinct parts that may work together to tell a story. There is the serpent, a large oval that some have mistakenly thought was an egg clasped in the serpent's jaws, and beyond the oval, there was a wishbone-shaped mound of which only a small remnant survives. One early archeologist thought the wishbone was a frog about to be eaten by the snake. More recent interpretations of the oval are that it is the serpent's eye, or gaping mouth, and the wishbone may be a representation of a powerful female spirit that mated with the great serpent in some American Indian traditions. The best available evidence indicates that Serpent Mound was built at around 1100 CE by an ancient American Indian group referred to as the Fort Ancient Culture. The name is confusing because the early archaeologists were confused. They found a village at the Fort Ancient Earthworks and assumed the villagers built the earthen walls and so named the culture after the site. But the village was established more than 500 years after the earthwork construction had ceased. Petrified Forest National Park is located in northeastern Arizona, USA, covering over 220,000 acres or nearly 900 square kilometers. 
The landscape is dominated by a series of mesas, buttes, and badlands, and is surrounded by one of the best preserved remnants of the Arizona shortgrass prairie. Established as a national monument in 1906, and later designated as a national park in 1962, Petrified Forest was set aside to preserve the scientific value of paleontological resources from the late Triassic period, between 225 and 205 million years ago. The most notable fossils are the abundant, colorful, and beautifully preserved deposits of petrified wood, constituting the most extensive accumulation of petrified wood in the world. Petrified Forest National Park also contains a large portion of the famed Painted Desert of Arizona, which is recognized as one of the most scenic areas on the North American continent. About one third of the park is designated as wilderness, with its striking, colorful badlands, unique rock formations, and vast open spaces these areas offer excellent opportunities for exploration and quiet reflection. But it was the vast amounts of fossilized logs that first attracted visitors to the area starting in the 1850s. These logs are mostly made up of quartz, and the rainbow of colors comes from mineral impurities within the quartz, such as iron, which results in a variety of reds, purples, oranges, and yellows. Some pieces can even resemble giant crystals, often sparkling in light. Petrified wood occurs throughout the entire park, but there are significant accumulations in five large geographical areas termed forests. These are the rainbow, crystal, jasper, blue, and black forests. The largest deposits are found in the rainbow forest and black forest, which is considered one of the most pristine fossil wood deposits in the world. In some places, the wood is so thickly accumulated that a person could walk for dozens of meters on wood without touching the ground. The number of petrified logs in the park is impossible to count, but is estimated to be in the tens of thousands, which does not include any subsurface logs. In addition to large logs, other plant fossils preserved in abundance include fossil leaves, stems, and seeds. This plant record includes representatives of all major groups of land plants from the late Triassic. Over 200 species of fossil plants have been described from the park, including 50 holotype specimens. These specimens are cataloged in the museum collection and made available for research. No other flora of the same age is known in the Northern Hemisphere outside of North America, and these plant fossils contain many forms not known outside of the Southwestern United States. The vertebrate fossil record here is also impressive. Over 100 fossil vertebrate species have been found from the park, including significant discoveries that have helped scientists understand the appearance and distribution of some of the earliest known dinosaurs from North America. Also preserved is a diverse record of amphibians and archosaurian reptiles, which includes etosaurs, phytosaurs, and rausukians, among many others. Fossils discovered at Petrified Forest have been key in our understanding of these groups, and researchers continue to discover more every year, including several previously unknown species found nowhere else in the world. Due to the expansive deposits of fossil wood and a diverse record of other plants and animals, the fossil record of Petrified Forest National Park is of outstanding universal value. Nearly 100 years of paleontological and geological research has resulted in over a thousand scientific publications. No other place on earth preserves as detailed of a late Triassic paleontological record, making this site a cornerstone of late Triassic research worldwide. crossed this land in all its shallowness, it could not have known the legacy it would leave behind. It could not have known the number of people who would cross on foot for the opportunity to take a picture or the desire to witness something beautiful. When the tectonic actions took over the landscape, creating mountains and basins, it would not have cared for the beauty it created. It would not have cared for the phenomenon that followed, for the diverse life that would inhabit it, or the unique adaptations that arose. When the rains plummeted towards the land, collecting into streams that would carry the Earth's minerals, it could not have envisioned the beauty that lied ahead. It could not have envisioned the immersive experience that one may seek, the unique understanding of life that came with it, 
or the desire to share that with the future. When the people of the southwestern marshes inhabited the grand Lake Otero, they would not have foreseen the history they left behind. They would not have foreseen the desire to learn from their footprints, the strides made to protect their evidence, or the enthusiasm it would bring to modern life. When the landscapes changed to desolation, it could not have predicted the nearing gifts the foreshadowed dunes would provide. It could not have predicted the ability to capture the imagination of not only children's minds, the power it beholds in the eyes of many, or the gift provided by the lack of destination. When the winds turned golden, transparent crystals into tiny particles of white gypsum, it would not have foretold the love beheld upon the land. It would not have foretold the importance it brought to the land of enchantment, to the modern history of the state, or the desire to protect by the people who call this place home. When we walk across the dunes, we cannot fathom the history we walk upon, nor the potential of its future. We cannot fathom the explosion of microbiomes that create the soil crust, the amount of wildlife that wander through here, or the sheer uncanny feeling that embraces our minds. White Sands is loved by many, of the past and the present, and we can be sure there will be more to come. Hi, I'm Cherie Butler, Deputy Superintendent at Statue of Liberty National Monument in Ellis Island. I'm standing on the balcony above the beautiful registry room known as the Great Hall, located inside the Ellis Island National Museum of Immigration. This is perhaps the single most important space on the island, as it played a central role in facilitating one of the largest global migrations in human history, what became known as the Great Atlantic Migration. More than 12 million immigrants were processed in this room. So imagine how it might have sounded and felt. Hundreds of immigrants crowded in this room, awaiting their turn with the immigration inspector, anxiously unsure but hopeful that the outcome would be the start of a new life in the United States. Hello, I'm Ranger Catherine. Ellis Island is located in the New York Harbor, just off the coast of New Jersey, amidst a backdrop of iconic landmarks and unrivaled views of the Manhattan skyline and the Statue of Liberty. Until the opening of the inspection station here, immigration was not regulated by the federal government. The number of people moving to the United States from overseas was low due to difficulties of travel, so states were allowed to make their own rules for newcomers entering their shores. In the late 19th century, steamships made trips to the United States from other continents faster, safer, and more affordable. As steamship travel became more accessible, many Europeans were deciding to leave their home countries due to factors such as conflict, famine, and persecution. At the same time, the U.S. was steadily gaining a reputation as a land of opportunity. Arrivals of immigrants to the United States began to sharply increase in the 1880s. This caused the federal government to take over regulating immigration from individual states for the first time in the nation's history. Since the Port of New York was one of the busiest points of arrival, Ellis Island was selected as the site of the first federal immigration inspection station, opening in 1892. About 80% of immigrants passed their inspections in a few hours with no issues. 10% of immigrants were detained for a medical reason, and another 10% were detained for a legal reason. After a stay in the hospital or a legal hearing, most of the detained immigrants were allowed to enter. Only about 2% of the 12 million who are processed at Ellis Island were not allowed to enter the United States. However, most people who found themselves in this room were unaware of their high chance of success. Immigrants usually spent about two to five hours on the island, but the brief medical and legal inspections only took a few minutes. Most of their time was spent waiting for their turn on benches in this impressive room. Changes in immigration laws shifted the way Ellis Island was used after 1924. Increasing arrival numbers led to new laws that restricted the amount of immigrants who were admitted and required them to obtain a visa before traveling. As a result, the flow of immigration was limited and only those who were detained were transported to the island. In 1954, Ellis Island closed its doors as an immigration station when there were fewer immigrants than staff. The island was abandoned until 1965, 
when a presidential proclamation by Lyndon B. Johnson added the site to the Statue of Liberty National Monument. It would take several decades and a major restoration before the island could be reopened as a museum in 1990. As Ellis Island sat abandoned in the harbor for over a decade, the government was unable to find a buyer for this expansive property. Though it was exposed to the harsh elements without proper maintenance, the relatively isolated setting preserved much of the evidence of what occurred here. The building and architecture are a testament to the demands of immigrant processing during the Great Atlantic Migration. There was a consistent need for more space during the island's operating period, which resulted in the expansion of the buildings and the island itself. The exterior of this building is just as awe-inspiring as this room. Completed in 1900, it replaced the original modest wooden structure destroyed by fire three years earlier. Designed by the New York architectural firm Boring & Tilton, the grand Beaux-Arts edifice features elaborate, classically inspired limestone ornament and granite trim incorporated into bold patterns of masonry, topped off by four copper-clad cupolas rising at each corner that create the most iconic architectural imagery of Ellis Island. Visitors to the museum can explore exhibits that cover the history of immigration in the U.S. They can walk the path taken by immigrants processed here, and they can even connect with their ancestors in the American Family Immigration History Center. In the Great Hall, natural light pours in through unique half-circle windows and highlights the magnificent Guastavino arched tile ceiling. The main immigration building on the north side of the island has been restored, and this room nearly looks the same as it did when the last immigrants were processed here. On the south side of the island, special hard hat tours allow visitors to explore the unrestored hospital complex that shows the passage of time. Ellis Island remains nearly 30 acres of a physical representation of one of the largest migrations of people in recorded history. While a portal of hope and freedom for most, it was an island of tears for those who were turned away when they failed to meet the requirements of immigration laws and regulations. The island setting and lack of later uses helped to preserve Ellis Island as a more complete representation of immigrant reception, examination, and detention than any other global property. My name is Betsy Smith. I am the President and Chief Executive of the Central Park Conservancy. The Conservancy is the organization that is responsible for nearly every aspect of Central Park's care, from its top to bottom restoration to daily maintenance and visitor services. Our work is grounded in the original purpose of the park, to serve as a place of respite from the stresses of the city for all New Yorkers. The Conservancy is delighted to be part of the U.S. ECOMOS celebration of the 50th anniversary of the World Heritage Convention. We are honored that Central Park has been selected to be on the U.S. tentative list. Central Park, for all its simple and sweeping beauty, is a complex, human-made masterpiece of landscape architecture on an immense scale, and it continues to serve as a model for cities and communities around the globe. From the undulating paths to the magnificent Belvedere Castle and its beautiful views, Central Park still reflects the era in which it was created. And yet it has always managed to remain timeless, bringing joy and peace to generations of visitors. More now on the story of Central Park. Central Park, the place where New Yorkers and visitors come to play, reflect, and recover from the stress of life in one of the loudest, busiest, most crowded cities on Earth. Its 341 hectares include eight bodies of water, 36 arches and bridges, dozens of sports fields and basketball courts, 10,000 benches, and 18,000 trees. It's known around the world as an enduring symbol of New York City. 42 million times a year, people come here to share New York City's backyard. Safe, free, and open to all. Its story dates to the 1840s, when New York was the most populous city in the Western Hemisphere, and its population was growing exponentially. As immigrants poured into Manhattan, private and gated enclaves were developed only for the well-to-do residents of surrounding homes. Many social reformers felt this was inconsistent with American values and understood that a public park could reverse the situation. In 1857, 
Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Fox were chosen to bring to life what was then a bold idea, a new city park, open to everyone. They set out to resolve this tear in the social fabric by creating a space designed to bring all people together regardless of their backgrounds. Olmsted and Vox laid out a landscape of sweeping meadows and bodies of water that somehow seem endless while actually being tucked neatly into Manhattan's rigid grid. The plan was naturalistic. Large pastoral landscapes and wooded areas would provide New Yorkers with a rural repose from the city. Although it's true that the park is human-made, the park's massive rocks are not. They are exposed portions of ancient bedrock, which heavily influenced how the park was designed and built. Workers excavated, removed, and reset about 364,000 cubic meters of rock. Much of it had to be blasted away to create the park's four sunken transverse roads that separate east-west traffic from the landscape. These transverse roads were a required element of the design competition. Olmsted and Vox hid them below the landscape, out of sight from park goers, a feature that preserves the park's sense of quiet isolation while allowing the city to go about its business. During its life, Central Park has experienced cycles of neglect and resurgence. Its low point came in the 1970s. Mismanagement and economic decline combined to turn the park into a lawless dust bowl. Its beautiful landscapes eroding, infrastructure crumbling, garbage piling up. Then, the people of New York City stepped in to save their park. The nonprofit Central Park Conservancy was set up in 1980. Its mission to restore, manage, and enhance Central Park in partnership with the public. Since then, the Conservancy has invested more than $1 billion fulfilling that ongoing mission. Hundreds of projects in every part of the park, a complete transformation. But the Conservancy's work runs even deeper. Daily maintenance, tree care, cleaning the water bodies, monitoring and working to mitigate the effects of climate change, public programming inviting people from all neighborhoods in New York to come play, relax, and find respite in this living masterpiece working with researchers to explore the history of the park and the pre-park, including Seneca Village, the largest community of African-American landowners in pre-Civil War New York, a community that was displaced to make room for the park. The Conservancy is dedicated to bringing this once forgotten but critical piece of New York's history to light and to sharing its findings with scholars and the community. In recent years, the Conservancy has worked to improve accessibility with new ramps and paths to major entrances, as well as renovated restrooms and improved playgrounds, among other efforts. Another reminder that all are welcome here. And when the pandemic came, Central Park was used as the site of an emergency field hospital and also took on an enhanced role in the lives of New Yorkers as a sanctuary. People have found solace in watching the seasons unfold, taking long walks, gazing at reflections on water, reading on benches, or studying birds. The park has also offered a sense of community, something so deeply missed during the global crisis. In Central Park, there is enough room for social distancing while still being with other people. We can be alone together. Central Park is a masterpiece of human creative genius. Through innovative landscape design, it preserves nature and the environment from the impact of the irreversible forces of urban growth. It is a place of beauty, wonder, solitude, togetherness, play, rest, and solace. A historic, pioneering public space, free and open to all, and a model for urban parks all over the world.
These are all amazing sites. You know, I was just thinking, I've been fortunate enough, incredibly fortunate enough to have visited them all. And I encourage all of you to do the same thing. I'd like to now introduce Sakina Moore, who is our program director for the development of a decision-making decision toolkit for dealing with monuments of oppression. And we're so lucky to have found Sakina. She's just a delight to work with. And she's put together just this enormously impressive team. I sit in sometimes on their meetings and mostly just because I, uh, it's a lot of fun to hear the ideas that they have. They're so inventive and, and uh, so, so adept at what they're doing. Um, it's really been an inspiration and joy to work with them. So with that, I turn it over to Sakina. Thank you, Doug. And good evening, and it is a pleasure to celebrate World Heritage with you tonight. My name is Sakina Moore, and I'm the program director of the Monuments Toolkit Project. Maya Angelou once said, history, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not to be lived again. As we celebrate World Heritage tonight, we are also celebrating monuments to people who embody the qualities that we aspire to and the events that we memorialize and want to commemorate. The year 2020 forced us as a global collective to take a hard look at ourselves in the mirror. Not only to take a hard look at ourselves in the mirror, but to deeply question our morals, our values, our social systems, our economic systems, and what kind of society do we want to be? And also, how do our monuments reinforce divisions or were created to tell incomplete and false stories? Continuing along with the murder of, Joy, of George Floyd and a lot of the, um, the events that, that surround the Confederate monuments, we were given a grant by Andrew W. Mellon to investigate oppressive monuments, contested monuments, and the histories that surround them. This time we are always, we're committed to elevate the voices that were ignored. For the next two years, the Monuments Toolkit Program, in addition to releasing a, a case study booklet, we are going to be releasing programming that will allow you to engage in real time with conversations that are that are happening with regards to to the monuments. And one of these, the programming that we have is the monumental project, which is going to be released very, very soon. And I'm excited to share with you tonight a video, a teaser video for the Monumental Project podcast. History affects us every day. Spanish philosopher George Santayana is credited with the famous quote, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Over the last couple of years, the intersection of heritage, governance, and how citizens interact with pieces of the past has been present in the public eye. Americans all across the nation are beginning to question the history around them, and many are noticing that the monuments and historic fixtures in their communities are unsolicited reminders of a darker time in our nation's history. Something needs to change. When we talk about the protests that brought that statue down and is bringing down other statues right now, it is really important that we recognize that there is a rich legacy of resistance to racist symbols that dates back to the moment that these objects were erected. This is where we come in. Welcome to the Monumental Project. 
how historic sites and monuments of yesterday affect us today. As the official companion podcast of the Monuments Toolkit program, we will be diving deep into the pieces of American history found across the nation and how the stories they carry impact the modern day American citizen. The goal of this podcast and the program at large is to answer the question, how do we address monuments of oppression? What are our options for dealing with painful pieces of our past? How can we learn, heal, and move forward? By the end of this season, we'll have a better understanding. We will be sitting down with historians, artists, community organizers, and even local citizens to hear what they have to say about the monuments in our parks, our school districts, our town centers, and everywhere in between. In order for us to heal as a society, we need to confront and face history in its totality. At U.S. Icomos, we believe that how we interact with our past can help us shape the future. After listening, we hope you feel the same. I'm Miles Ezilo, and this is The Monumental Project. Every day, the Monuments Toolkit Project is growing. Uh, as we, at least, or uh, as we unveil more programming and more think pieces about the monuments discussion. And I wanna make sure that everybody knows to follow us on social media platforms. And of course, usicomos.org. Thank you very much and happy World Heritage Day. Thank you, Sakina. And really, this is above and beyond the call of duty because she was recently diagnosed with COVID. And I think, I think she's still suffering from it to some extent. So thank you, Sakina. She's doing a, just a terrific, terrific job. We have some time now, perhaps about 10 minutes, when we could take questions about the tentative list that you've seen. Um, we see a question coming in from Professor Charles Musiba. Charles is a member of our board of trustees. He's also a very famous, preeminent um, paleoanthropologist. I've had the pleasure of working with him, going to sea sites and Tanzania with him, He's, you should see him. He's amazing in the field. He's amazing in the classroom. He's amazing with his publications. Anyway, he's worked at uh, at uh, look at the Latoli footprints, you know, the early footprints um, in in Africa. And he had a question about uh, the preservation of the footprints that were recently discovered at White Sands. And I'm not sure if we've got somebody from White Sands listening in. If we don't. Hello, this is Marie Sauter. I'm the superintendent of White Sands National Park. And I can't tell you what a beautiful presentation it was. So the question, um, yeah. The question is, how do we preserve the footprints? Um, that's a tremendous challenge. There are tens of thousands of footprints, not only human footprints, but also um, the Ice Age animals, Ice Age mammals. And they are obviously are inter interwoven, uh, living together, cohabitating. Um, that's a tremendous challenge, and it's something that the park staff and scientists are grappling with. And um, we're certainly open to ideas. We're, we're definitely concerned about climate change and the effects of uh, weather and uh, very localized weather that may have on the Tularosa Basin. Uh, Tular the Tularosa Basin is a wet ecosystem. And the dune system is, is, is quite wet and water is tremendously important to the, the system. So. Thank you. Th thank you so much. Um, we have a couple of other questions. I'm looking at the time. Uh, Ariana, let me know if I'm getting close, okay? Because we do need to have a toast here at some point. Uh, I've, I have my U.S. Ecomos glass waiting to be filled. So um, we have another question. Can you briefly outline the process that follows the inclusion on the tentative list? And it, there's another one here. How can folks support getting the U.S. tentative 
heritage sites, tentative list, world heritage sites, actually inscribed on the official list. Well, it's it's a it's an honor, a great honor to be put on the tentative list. There's a process, there's a competition. Um, several years ago, it was my honor to chair the committee that that produced the most recent tentative list. We had input from all the preeminent heritage organizations and we USC must actually did a gap study, which resulted in including things like the civil rights sites. Um, but it, to actually produce the dossier, the nomination dossier is an enormous effort. So it really depends upon marshalling the people, the support, the funding um, to move it beyond being on the tentative list uh, and producing a, a nomination dossier. So one of the reasons we're having this discussion of this presentation at the Celebration of World Heritage just to make people aware of that, uh, to marshal support uh, for the sites that are on the tentative list and many of the preeminent sites that you've, you've seen this evening. Uh, let's see. I guess at this point in time, we should raise our glasses. Um, it is, we, what we're celebrating is very diverse. I'm getting my glass. <laughs> I'm filling my glass. Um, we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the World Heritage Convention. And we're also celebrating those sites that we've just heard about and seen videos about that are on the current tentative list. We're celebrating the fact that they have acquired that status. But I think we're also celebrating the prospect of working together to utilize a diversified heritage as a means toward peace and prosperity for all humanity and for the sustainability of our planet. This is um, a new type of heritage that we'd like to produce. And I think working together, we can do that. So please, let's all raise our glasses. in celebration. It's very good. Even better from a U.S. Ecomos glass. So, all right. And with that, I want to thank you all. Um, I've been very moved by the videos that we've seen, the words about our monuments program. And uh, it's my honor to have served as president. Uh, I think we've accomplished quite a bit in the last couple of years. It's not, it doesn't really have anything much at all to do with me. It really has to do with the incredible board of trustees that have really donated so much of their time and effort and love. And I wanna thank you all. And I wanna thank the membership too. Uh, so with that, I think we're gonna move on uh, and see you next year. We, and don't forget to attend our uh, our conference and symposium, which will be this fall, and you'll hear more about that too. So with that, let's transition. Thank you again. And I hope that we can all meet in person in the not too distant future next year. Thank you. <laughs>